Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Um, I'm Jenny Tudge. I'm the Director of Development here at Keeble, um, indeed the finest college in Oxford. It's a great pleasure. Thank you. Um, the show starts here. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, members of the wider university to the uh, reunion weekend and, of course, lots of our dear, dear Keeble alumni and friends. Uh, it's great to see you. Thank you for joining us. So, um, Dave Norwood, what can I say? Keeble alumnus, honorary fellow, chess grandmaster, and probably the best looking man that ever read history at Keeble. <laughs> His words, not mine. <coughs> but more importantly, Dave has been the founder of a series of really so successful science, technology, and investment companies. Glittering career. Um, and most recently, of course, founder of Oxford Sciences Innovation, which is already having a terrific impact on global technology uh, at, it, within Oxford. And as we open our new HB Allen Centre here at Keeble, um, he'll have an impact, on, and the company will have an impact, on what we are able to do here. So it is a great pleasure to introduce Dave. He's off to Hong Kong tomorrow, so we're very, very lucky to have him. I know you'll give him a very warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. What she didn't say that, amongst all my great accolades, I was a really crap historian. Uh, not a scientist, I couldn't do science, but I got to do history. And um, as a result, I'm going to indulge myself and have a bit of fun and pretend I'm a history professor. Um, so I'm going to start with Keeble, which we all know about. I arrived in uh, 1988, 30 years ago. Can you believe it? 30 years. And the first thing I did when I arrived is go to the Lambeth Flag with you lot, 30 years ago. That was it. Um, but I'm going to go back a bit further. Now, if you're wondering why I'm so scruffy, I'm always scruffy. But Jenny said, I've got to wear this T-shirt, which, you remember that dinosaur on the wall? That's what it is. So I thought, it's a good place to start. We'll start with the dinosaurs. So... My history professor, who was an amazing man, sadly no longer with us, Dr. Eric Stone, um, always said to me, like, the, the great thing about history is you, you can know as much or as little as you want. And if you don't know a lot about something, it doesn't matter, just as long as you've got enough for your own purposes. And, and actually, it's great advice I've used through life. And what's interesting about dinosaurs is it, I don't know much about them except they lived a very long time ago, and they're not around anymore. That's kind of all I need to know for this lecture. And similarly, I move on to these guys. Um, they're called Homo erectus. And the, the, I read a recent article on them, which is about the extent of my knowledge, which said that they, were, they probably went extinct because they were quite lazy. Um, and I kind of wondered, how on earth do you know if someone's a, a species that lived all the time ago is lazy or not? Well, apparently it's because they didn't evolve any of their tools for about a million years. They were pretty much using the same tools. Now... You could say that's the reason they went extinct. I kind of like that. I always saw myself as being a little bit lazy. So, and, 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 it, and just from perspective, these guys lived a lot longer than we have, Homo sapiens. So they managed to survive well over a million years. And they didn't innovate, and they were quite lazy. Now, that's pretty impressive by my book, and probably a good lesson for us. <laughs> pretty amazing, right? Uh, and then that brings us to a sort of slightly more modern times, about 190,000 years ago. People like us start appearing in the world. And, um, and obviously, this is where the story of you know, what we see as current humanity begins. Um, and we did innovate. We did lots of innovation. It, that innovation took a long time. We did things like wheels and tools and all that sort of stuff. And we, it didn't go that fast, but we innovated. So that about 10,000 years ago, modern civilization began. Um, and you started to, to, to have people living in the same place, which is an amazing concept because for a lot of time, people moved around. And then obviously with farming, the ability to all exist together um, was this incredible, an incredible development in human experience where we all came together. And that's, that's roughly 10,000 years ago, which actually is not that long ago when we think back to those dinosaurs. So I think it's really good perspective when we're thinking about technology to think of that sort of time scale 
And actually, we're only really talking about 10,000 years since humans started to live together in organized societies. That's something quite fascinating. Um, if you actually put it in perspective, in terms of industrial uh, economies, that's only really about 100 years. So, you know, I'm not particularly good at maths, but 100 years versus 10,000 is about 1%. So we've only been living as, as, as organized societies for like 10,000 years. But we've only been really living as industrial societies for about 1% of that time, which again is, is, is sort of an amazing sort of thing to reflect on. Um, right, now, obviously you've got the exciting speech about what is it, global politics and chaos with uh, uh, the warden and Ed Balls, uh, which is gonna be a bigger draw, but I've got, this is why mine's better, right? This is why you mind's better, because we're going to have presents and prizes, right? So it's going to be a bit more fun. <laughs> now, because that's my strategy. When you're struggling, just give something to someone that will get them drunk. And all will be okay. And it's worked perfectly well for 30 years. So I'm not going to stop now. Right, so here is a chance. Um, does anyone know who this is? And you can't know, you can't answer if you've helped me put the presentation together, <laughs> which which Rosie very kindly did. So does anyone know, hands up, don't shout out, hands up if you know who this fellow is. Hand up. Well done, you won it, well, fantastic. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. <laughs> so that is a really special gin. That's actually about innovation. That is Oxford's first ever gin. Enough to do with me, so I'm not promoting it. Oxford's first ever gin, and it's used, it's got an exclusive license from the University of Oxford, from the Physics Garden, which was the world's first botanical garden, and using botanicals to create a new gin, and it gets you very drunk. It's brilliant. Try it. <laughs> so this guy was a till of the hunt, okay? And this was the year he died. He died in 453 AD, and he actually died. He went out, he, he, just before he died, he resolved that he was going to have another crack at Constantinople. He was totally pissed off with the Constantine Empire, and, and he's like, no, I'm going to get them. They've stopped paying me money. And he resolved he was going to go and conquer Constantinople, bring down Byzantium. Uh, but unfortunately, he just married a beautiful young wife. And at the wedding feast, he got seri obviously seriously drunk, and he ended up choking somewhat suspiciously and mysteriously. So he died in 453, died that night of, uh, of the wedding feast, which was pretty bad luck. Um, and then nothing at all happened for the next thousand years. Like I studied history, and they'll have you believe the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages or whatever we now call it. Actually, nothing really happened. Like I said, I wasn't a very good historian, but I'm allowed my minute on the stage. So nothing happened for, <laughs> nothing happened for a thousand years. It's true. Um, so 453, exactly a thousand years later, um, Constantinople did fall. As we know, the Turks, uh, the Ottoman Empire defeated them in this rather splendid image. And that created massive ruptures throughout the civilized world. Um, lots of new ideas, lots of trauma. trauma. Trauma is always a very good time for innovation, interestingly enough. Lots of trauma. Um, and then you add, obviously, things like the Renaissance, the Scientific Revolution, the Industrial Revolution, and all of those great things, which I'm not going to talk about, because um, actually they weren't really relevant. Uh, actually, nothing really happened for another 500 years, right? This is revisionist history. So nothing at all happened until 1953. I promise you. I've been thinking about this for 30 years. Nothing happened until 1953. And then two amazing things happened in 1953. And here's a chance to win another, but you're not allowed to. So <laughs> you get the chance to win another bottle of gin. Right, so, and again, you're not allowed to answer if you know, if you get my drift. Um, so put your hand up and give me one of those incredible things that happened in 1953. Uh-huh. <laughs> There is definitely no gin going anywhere in that direction. <laughs> so come on, hands up. Uh, close, close, close. I'd, I'd almost give you the gin for that, but I'm not going to. 
Um, hmm? Nope. Nope. Hands, I want to see a hand. I want to see a hand with conviction. No. I thought you were a little clever. I go around saying, all oh, my keyboard contemporaries were so brilliant, they've gone on to change the world, set up businesses, and you don't know the single most important thing. That's shocking. Right. <laughs> so many things start and end in the pub. Um, a bursar of uh, another college, which I won't mention, but it was Christchurch, complained about me for always mentioning pubs. But pubs are unbelievably important in the history of, of innovation. And it, it breaks my heart uh, still today that one of the greatest innovations happened in the wrong university. Um, but on a morning, a late morning, two brilliant young scientists walked into the Eagle Pub in Cambridge, and I still think it's one of the best lines in the history of the world, and announced to people having lunch, we've just discovered the key to life. Um, and that was Crick and Watson with their discovery of DNA in 1953. Um, and I think this is, is, is in the last 10,000 years, by far the most significant thing that's happened to humanity. And, and certainly, it, it's, it's a good way of explaining the last hundreds of millions of years. So I think this was one of the great uh, inventions. And I believe that the implications of this discovery are only just being felt today, 50, 60 years on. Um, at the same time, another amazing person who was unknown, really, in his day, in, in, in lots of ways, or probably known uh, almost for the wrong thing, uh, Alan Turing, who now is rightly recognized as one of the greatest thinkers in history. Um, in 1953, he published in a very obscure journal, which I, I managed to sort of dig out a few years ago, uh, a journal called Faster Than Thought, um, some of his early observations. Now, Turing, as you know, was a keen chess player. He actually wasn't that good, but he was a brilliant mathematician. I was a good chess player and a crap mathematician, so he probably got the better deal. Uh, but he worked alongside a lot of other chess players at Bletchley Park, some of whom I, oddly enough, knew in my early career. And they would tell me what an amazing person he was. And he was, he was instrumental in winning us the sort of war effort. And you all know the story that is now famous, OK? Uh, what, what's also interesting is his early work on artificial intelligence. Um, and I spent, I spent a lot of time looking at, at, at number five. Now, this became known as the Turing test, which presumably you're all sort of familiar with. But, but his idea was, if you pose a problem to um, something in a room, imagine there's a room and you ask that room a question, and from the answer that you get, you can't see what's in the room, you just get an answer. Uh, will you be able to distinguish if that answer's come from a human or a computer? And that was sort of accepted as, as uh, the, 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 the Turing test. And, and for many years, it became a sort of a contest. And there's lots of different incarnations of, of the Turing test. I actually worked on one which gave two chess positions. And from the move you would make in that chess position, I could always tell whether it was a computer or a human being. I'm not going to go into that now because I don't want to fall down a rabbit hole. But amazing ideas which are becoming more and more relevant today. You cannot pick up. I defy you to pick up any newspaper or read any business plan anywhere in the world which doesn't refer to AI. So this has gone from a really obscure, quirky idea in an obscure journal to being the center of every single thing in the world today. And I think it really did start with this guy who produced the first ever program. It wasn't actually a computer. His chess program was actually the first example of a computer program. Um, but actually, what was more interesting to me, and something I think is so profound, uh, is the point number four. So yes, the Turing test is interesting, but I don't think it's anywhere near as interesting as earlier's point. And this has rather been neglected by pretty much everybody. But I think it's something to, to consider today. So if one thinks why things take so long, I'm slightly going out on a limb here as a crap historian, you think it takes like millions of years for even the slightest change to happen. And, um, and those poor Homo erectus people who didn't really innovate in a million years. Well, imagine if you had a sort of innovation machine. So imagine if you've got a, a computer that does something 
does it badly, such as playing me at chess, so it then loses, actually then plays me, learns from losing to me, and then plays me again and again and again, or plays other people, and learns from that experience so that it constantly improves. Now, I believe we are in an amazing time in history, an amazing time for Oxford, and an amazing time for Keyboard, because I believe this idea is finally happening. It was, it was proposed in 1953, but I think it's finally becoming relevant today, the idea that, that in artificial intelligence is not just intelligent, it's got the ability to learn. Because humans instinctively are very bad at learning. It takes ideas, very, they, they've got to go very, very difficult routes to learn, whereas these things learn in seconds, and that's why I think we're at a very interesting time in history. So these two amazing ideas in 1953, um, I think will come to define the age that we live in. And believe it or not, I think Oxford has got an amazing opportunity in these two big trends, which, and it, I realize for me, it all goes back to keep, keep a pigeonhole. This is true. It all started in the pigeonhole at Keeble, modern world, or oh, that's my interpretation, in 1989, when I got a message in my pigeonhole. I still miss my pigeonhole. Um, it was like a sign of everything, wasn't it, that pigeonhole? It's like, are you popular? Are you gonna get invited to the next dinner? Does anyone love you? You know, it was amazing. So I got a message in a pigeonhole where it was like, you got to ring this number. So fair enough, I, we had like coins and you put, or maybe I had a, a phone card, I can't remember. But anyway, a message in a keyboard pigeonhole said, ring this number. And, and I still remember this was sort of, 19, and if you forgot what the 1980s looked like, there's an image which Rosie kindly found from the 1980s. So you've got uh, the, 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 the King's Arms in a very different color, and the old history faculty, you remember that? Isn't that amazing? So cast your mind back to the 80s, I, get, I, I, I make a call, and someone says to me, you're, you're a good chess player, we need you to commentate on a chess match, and it's happening this week. And I said, well, I can't, I'm, it's the middle of term. Term time is only eight weeks. I'm pretty behind as it is. And, and, and they're, like, <laughs> they're like, no, we need you. It's only five days. And I'm like, look, there's just no way I can do it. And they said, we'll pay you a thousand pounds. I said, I'll be there. <laughs> Think 1989, a thousand pounds. Remember our cater cards, right? Remember battles bills? I mean, that's a lot of money. That's half a year's so a thousand quid for four days' work. And they're like, right, well, you've got to come. I said, I'll be there. Don't just give me the address. It's in London. They said, well, it's a rather different type of chess match. I couldn't care less. I'll be there a thousand pounds. So when I got there, I had no clue about anything. Um, and um, it, it was really quite a surreal, a surreal match. So when I, first thing I arrived, and, I was already a grandmaster, just in as rather embarrassingly, I did actually have a business card <laughs> with chess grandmaster on, which I'm sure <laughs> he will show you. And I was always looking for work, especially if it paid a thousand pounds, right? So I turned up, and, and you don't need to be a chess grandmaster to know that normally in a chess game, you've got two people. So I noticed pretty on, Sherlock Holmes at Am, that this was a different type of chess match. And I said, we're slightly missing one player. Do you want me to play? And they said, no, 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 we've got it all worked out. Now, this guy was an amazing guy, um, Donald Mickey, who, uh, who actually worked with Turing at Bletchley Park. And they would go uh, to the canteen. And, and, and they got involved in a bet about who would produce the first sort of computer program, who could first produce the first chess computer that could beat a master. So again, this is going back to the sort of early 1950s. So he explained to me that they'd had this bet, of course. And this is in some ways a tragedy of history, how, how history works. You've got Crick and Watson who become the most celebrated, famous scientist in history. And poor Turing who is, who is sort of victimized and kills himself a year later. Um, but, but interestingly, his ideas rippled through the decades um, in that romantic way that ideas do. And this chap, explained to me that him and Turing had had this initial bet. They both thought that it'd be five years or so before they could get the chess program to be a master. And what is amazing is even the smartest people in the world can get it so wrong. Uh, they were so out, they were so out by years. And, and this fellow, who I knew quite well, was a sort of chess player, computer scientist, who kept betting on whoever 
was the sort of next. I'll bet you that a chess computer won't beat me. And through the decades, he won. And he, he, he made himself quite famous and made quite a bit of money just betting against the AI people that they'd never be able to create a chess computer to beat him. And, and, and it goes back to initial bet that, that Turing made with Donald Mickey. So he explained the whole context. And, and this was a seminal moment in the history of artificial intelligence. But no one really talked about it. It was, it, was, it was sort of not heard of at all. It was an obscure little match in London. They couldn't get anyone to commentate, so they had to get me and bribe me a thousand quid. I had no idea why I was there. But what I didn't realize at the time, I was seeing history. Uh, because this computer program that I think had originated out of Carnegie Mellon uh, defeated this master 4-0. So it's the first time ever. And he was pretty crap, if I'm honest. He wasn't a great master. <laughs> and obviously, having had a few drinks and been paid a thousand pounds, I actually inadvertently said this. <laughs> I always get myself in trouble. And then the sponsor said, well, what, you think you could beat it? I said, of course I could beat it. I could beat it after be playing, I could beat it after drinking a whole bottle of champagne for breakfast. And he said, right, done, it's a bet. I love bets. So the next morning, they all witnessed me, witnessed me drink a whole bottle of champagne, and I had to play this machine, and I had it beaten, but I think because I sobered up, it ended in a draw. <laughs> and, uh, but at least I stopped the machine. And, and I remember saying to them, look, you know, Go and, go and work on it to the team. Go, go and work on this, this computer. When it's ready, I'll play it in a proper match and beat it. Because, you know, you're young and confident. And they said, thanks for your help. Uh, anyway, th this, this machine was called Deep Thought. And, uh, and I became friends with the sort of Deep Thought team. And I would send it puzzles and see, can your machine solve this? And some it could, some it couldn't. And I still thought, actually, it's not developing as fast as I thought it would. And I remember still saying to them, why don't you come and play me again. I'm ready for another match. Um, and I kind of grew up, left Keeble, went to London, and still kept in touch. And they were like, no, we've got a different idea. Anyway, what happened is Deep Thought got noticed by IBM, who were a very big company in those days. And they said, we will sponsor this machine if you rename it um, after us, and we'll call it um, Deep Blue. And this. Um, is an amazing moment. It's recognized by a lot of AI people as probably the most important sort of development in, in, in the computer. 1997, the greatest chess player in history, Guy Kasparov, uh, played against Deep Thought that's now become Deep Blue. Um, everyone thought he was going to win. He beat everybody. He didn't. He lost. So it's a very important point in the history of evolution. And, and if you think he's faking it here, what I can tell you is I saw him um, just for Christmas last year, which is 20 years on, and he's still pissed off about it. <laughs> um, about the same time, and, and, and obviously having been involved in this sort of deep, deep thought, deep blue experiment, um, and, and getting more and more interested in technology, and remember, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeless at technology, I, I can't do science, I can't do computing, but. I've been lucky enough to be sort of close to some of these great people involved. Uh, another amazing thing was happening around the same time. And again, sort of think back 1953, 50 years before some of these ideas become real. So 50 years almost exactly, because it was probably 2003 rather than 2000, because everything inventor does he slightly hypes. Um, but 50 years on, those two big inventions the discovery of DNA, the idea of intelligent computers, they both almost mature at exactly the same point in history. And, and Clinton announced to the world that the single most important event in humanity, milestone for humanity, for once I don't think it's an exaggeration. I think it was, if anything, we've underplayed the significance. So from discovery of DNA in 53, it took 50 years before we could actually sequence a human, which is an amazing thing. Right. That was the first half of uh, the talk. The next half, I'm going to try and talk about what you wanted me to talk about. Um, so my story started crystallizing in 2000, where having seen some of these early ideas, hanging around with some of the brilliant scientists in Oxford, particularly some of the Keeble ones, um, I'd already started to think there's an amazing opportunity. Oxford's got some of the best ideas in the world. How can we get those ideas out into the world? How can we be the ones who 
wander into the pub and boast about finding an idea that's going to change the world. And, and I've devoted much of my life to this problem. Much of my life, I, I'm not embarrassed to say, has been a failure, because actually trying to do this is, is very hard, and most of the time I get it wrong and fail, but I keep going. So this was one of the few things that I'm really proud of in the last 30 years. Um, Oxford University wanted to build a new chemistry department. They were 20 million pounds short. They needed 20 million pounds very quickly. They came to me and said, you like science, you're good at raising money, and you're a little bit mad. And I said, yes to all three. They said, can you raise us 20 million pounds? I said, yes, but in return, I would like to um, have a stake in every idea that comes out of that chemistry department forever. And they said, well, forever's a long time, but we'll give it you for 15 years. So this was in 2000, at the same time as the Human Genome Project. And, and I set up a company around that called IP Group. And we set off trying to turn some of the ideas from the chemistry department into great companies. Uh, what's interesting about these things is um, you look back and, and, and historians tend to sort of interpret the past as this logical consequence that, that, that ends up at the right place. And it, the reality is not. The first five years, literally everything we did went wrong. Literally every idea we had in that chemistry department, which I'd been told was brilliant, failed. And I'm like, this is an absolute disaster. We're, we're five or 15 years in. We've spent all of our money, <laughs> and every single thing has gone wrong. <laughs> How can this be? You know, so, so happily, um, we came up with an idea in the pub, uh, probably inspired by uh, the eagle and that idea. And it was in the King's Arms. And uh, we founded a company called Oxford Nanopore. And I'm going to talk about that a bit more in a second. Um, but again, playing on this theme, my chess protege from all those years ago, when I was actually at Keeble, interestingly enough, uh, you've probably heard of DeepMind. Everyone heard of DeepMind that's acquired by Google for $600 million. It's now seen as the sort of ultimate AI engine. Again, just think of the history. Think of Deep Thought, Deep Blue, DeepMind. That's how it went. All that same. And now probably the biggest research project in the world today is, is Google's work in artificial intelligence. So. That's an interesting context for what we're talking about. And again, it goes back to 2015, where the modern story starts for me, um, which is, again, we, 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 we ended up back in the King's Arms uh, for what I think is a fairly unique partnership in the world today. Um, so that 15-year experiment in um, the chemistry department, five years went terribly. The next 10 years, we did some interesting things. The university said, um, we rather like that experiment, but why just chemistry? Why not do it across the whole science base of Oxford University? At this point, I was retired, living up a, at a mountain with my lovely wife, and I said, I'm not interested at all in doing that. The investors didn't take no for an answer. They said, no, let, let's try and do something completely unique. Let's do something big on a kind of, even by US standards, let's do something big. Let's create something in Oxford that is huge. So we spent a lot of time, and finally we put together um, a company called Oxford Sciences Innovation. And it's only got one mission. It's to help the best science in Oxford change the world. That's really what we're trying to do. Everything else is a sort of detail to that mission. And in order to do that, we pulled some of the biggest investors in the world into, into the journey. Because one thing I've learned through the years, if it's just you battling on your own in Oxford, you're not going to globalize ideas. It's really hard. But if you get some of the people who control the world to help you on that journey, it becomes a hell of a lot easier. So the first thing I said is, right, rather than it just being a few mates of mine from Keeble, let's bring in the biggest companies in the world on this journey. So we raised 600 million pounds from these people, including Google, including Sequoia, including Tencent, obviously the Wellcome Trust, who's the biggest funder of science in Oxford, pulled all of them and said, come on this journey, come and help us do this. Oxford has really got some of the best ideas in the world. With your support, with your money, but your passion and your networks, we can create something incredible here. So one of the things that I did in my pitch, so it's a chance to win a bottle of gin again. So, and you failed at the last one, so I hope you do better. And again, you can't answer if you know. Can anyone guess what this is? 
Does anyone know what this is? Other than people who know. Hmm? What does it do? Hmm? <laughs> well, you know. Come on, I have one, one guess. Given what we talked about, what could it be? What is the most important invention in history? DNA, DNA sequencing. Who said it? You can't. You're the bursar. <laughs> who, who? You said it. Done. There you are. Well done. He gets it. So. Well done. I've only got one left. Um, so, why is this important? Well, we said earlier, um, 1953 is when we discovered DNA. It took 50 years before we sequenced the first person. Another detail is that it took a very long time. It took about $3 billion to do one human's genome. And it required a room this size. When we set off in that pub, the King's Arms, all those years ago with Oxford Nanopore, we said, like, imagine if you could sequence DNA of a human or a plant or a bacteria or a virus. Imagine if you could sequence the DNA from a handheld device for $1,000. And that was like a dream, right? If you can, and that's why I think this will be one of the biggest ideas in the world. Um, I've lost my slide. It's disappeared. Was it gone? It's nipped off. Sorry. Come back. Come back. No, I've lost it. Where did it go? Where's my thing gone? Oh, sod it. It's gone. Right, I'll have to wing it as usual. So, why is this a big idea? Because earlier this year, in fact, maybe it is there. You can see how well I've prepared. Where's it gone? Ah, yeah. Sorry, I messed it up. Doesn't matter. We went back to, this time to the Lamb and Flag, because I felt it had been neglected, at the start of this year to celebrate this event. This was a nature paper, um, basically chronicling how this little machine had sequenced a whole human genome for the first time ever, which was a sort of a seminal time. And, and the valuation of this little company that we'd set up in the King's Arms hit $2 billion. So it gives you an idea of the power of a technology that is truly disruptive. So, I mean, slightly ruin my own presentation. I'm going to go back. Right, so this is some of the new ideas, some of the new ideas. Think 2015, which is actually only three years ago. See, some of the new ideas in Oxford today that we're getting really excited about. So this, believe it or not, is a super resolution microscope. Um, again, I'm, not, I'm a historian, so I don't understand what it does. Except that what it does, why everyone is really excited about these things is because they allow you to observe individual molecules in motion. And if you're a chemist or a biotech company, I talk to them a lot, this is the holy grail. And that's why they're prepared to pay a million dollars for this room full of ugly equipment. Okay? This was not invented in Oxford. More importantly, it was not invented by a Keeble scientist. This was invented by a Keeble scientist. Bo Jing, who you probably won't have met because he's usually working hard. Um, we're his biggest shareholder and we can't pin him down. He's probably the brightest guy I've ever seen. He's a Keeble scientist. And he, here is in the Science Museum, showing a microscope from about 300 years ago with his super resolution microscope. Now, again, just to remind yourself, that is on the market today, cost a million dollars, but he's seen as a breakthrough technology. I think three years ago, it won the Nobel Prize. This is what a keyboard guy has shrunk it to. Now, this DNA is obviously unbelievably important, especially if you can sequence DNA, something this size, but the ability to observe experiments, to observe molecules interacting drugs, interaction of molecules on drugs in real time on a desktop device, I think is truly revolutionary. I think it will change biotechnology forever. I think it will change the way scientists research. And he's taken it from an idea to 
commercialization in just over a year. We'll probably sell many millions of dollars worth this year. A truly revolutionary idea. Um, and this rather amazing image is from that microscope. Uh, and if there's one unicorn, if you said to put, put, put the gun to my head and said, which idea in Oxford is going to be a unicorn, uh, it would be, it would be Bo's work. And I think not only will it make lots of money for its investors, I think the impact it will have is, is enormous. And th this is a really amazing image seen from this. Um, this is of a really cool idea. Um, so, the last chance to win a bottle of gin. What is it? And you can't answer if you know. Hmm? Yeah, but what is it beyond the diamond? Why is it special? You can't just say it's a diamond. Hmm? It's not artificial. Um, there's something else about it. Hmm? Who said that? Yes! So, this is... Yes, well done. Right, well done. That was great. I'm out, I'm out of gin. Inspired. Well done. Right, so what is special about this diamond? It's the first diamond ever to have a laser writing something inside it. And you can just about see the name of the company up there. And it says, well, you can't read it, but actually it says Obsidian. And I think it's pretty amazing. Um, no one else is doing it. De Beers have been trying to do this for years and years and years. And these smart people have created the ability to write anything on the inside of a diamond so it can't be scratched off, which obviously has massive implications for security of diamonds, to make sure you don't have blood diamonds, all of those things. And they just announced recently that De Beers are trialing it with new artificial diamonds, interestingly enough. So pretty cool technology. Even more cool is one of our keyboard blues, because uh, they get everywhere. Jamie uh, showing off his honeycomb hat, and he's actually with Hazel, who runs talent at OSI. Jamie is uh, one of Keeble's best ever rowers. I think uh, him and his brother were the only twins for about 30 years to, to beat Cambridge. Uh, he's also invented something really cool, and we, we've backed him to do it, and he's created the world's first helmet that fits on your head. So Jamie hangs around our office surreptitiously, scanning our heads, and the idea is you have a perfect helmet that fits the contours of your head, and, and the plan is to sort of reduce head trauma, and make cycling and any other sport a lot safer. And again, a really cool idea from a keyboard guy. Um, I've done my thing. This is another, we, as well as doing sort of sensible things like a, uh, a helmet that will hopefully reduce brain trauma, we also do some really, really crazy things. Things that might not work. You can't be on the edge of science and see it as you would any other startup. We've got to accept that most of the things we do will fail. That's what's romantic about it. This is an amazing thing. We've all got it in our bodies. It's called an exosome. It's a tiny sack of fat. Um, we've actually done something a bit mad. We've given this company, and we managed to bring in the likes of Google and some big sort of American investors. We've given this company 50 million pounds. It's got no revenue. It's got no product. It's just got an idea. And that seems insane. Why have we done that? Because we think exosomes have got the potential to revolutionize so many diseases. So if you take a, we're all getting on a bit. We're all at our 30 years or whatever anniversary, so we're all got to think about this now. We're all going to be uh, worrying about neurodegeneration, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, all these terrible things that afflict us because we all live a lot longer. Um, this, I think, is, is the best potential for something that can cross the blood-brain barrier. The reason you, these, these diseases are so hard to treat is because getting something through the blood-brain barrier is notoriously difficult, and these things are able to do it. They've already proven they can do it, for instance, in mice. So the reason they've given this idea of 50 million pounds is let's see if it can work. Let's see if the body has got, got things called exosomes which will treat major diseases. It's crazy. It's mad. 
but it's the kind of stuff we're trying to do in Oxford. And one of these ideas can, can change the world. Um, if I had any bottles of gin left, you could win one here, but I'm not. So tell me what this is. Anyone? You've got to do it for love now, not for gin. Anyone any idea what that is? Who said that? Got it right again? You could have won. So that is an ultrasound image of a heart. It's not just any old heart. It's a very special heart. It's my heart. <laughs> and the joke around the office was, the amazing thing is he's got a heart. Yeah. The second amazing thing is my heart is fine. Which just, which just feels fundamentally wrong. <laughs> Although it's been a few months since I, I, I did this, so it could have gone downhill. But apparently my heart's okay. Now, that's, that in itself is not revolutionary. You're all, well, not all, but some of you like me, who've probably not lived as well as you should, would have gone and had a stress echo test and had this image, and then you would have had a human being saying, actually, you're fine, go home, or you know what, you need to go and get this properly looked at. What's special about this is I'm one of the first people uh, to be told not by the head of cardiology in Oxford University that my heart is fine, although he was there. What he said to me is the AI algorithm says that your heart is fine, Dave, which is an amazing moment. Because he said the reason you should be reassured about that is because this algorithm is already better than any cardiologist in the world. So just think about that. Think back to Gary Kasparov, Gary Kasparov looking really glum. The reason he looked really glum is he realized he wasn't special anymore. He was the best in the universe, and then suddenly he wasn't. I realized quite a long time ago that my ch the only thing I was really good at was chess. And I actually became redundant in the early 90s because a machine could do it better than me. So I think mine was the first profession. The chess computer was the first ever computer. And it was also the first profession to be made redundant by a computer. Now, you, if you ask me for my advice about chess, it's just for fun. On your phone, you'll get a better way of diagnosing any chess position than anything I could tell you. That's, that's already happening. I think there's a breakthrough moment where if you want to check if you're okay, if your heart's okay, you should not be listening to a top cardiologist. You should be listening to an AI algorithm. And again, it all goes back to 1953. This is interesting. Um, again, this is another crazy thing we've given ridiculous sums of money to, and we've no idea if it's going to work. Uh, we actually did give it to this shrimp. <laughs> We're not that crazy, right? So, so what is interesting about this shrimp is that one claw is bigger than the other. Now, I wouldn't even, I'm not, as my wife will tell you, I don't notice things, so I wouldn't even notice that, right? But Oxford's full of really geeky people, as we know, and, and this ge geeky guy who I really like, he, he actually spent a lot of time thinking about this, like years and years and years. <laughs> and um, what he thought was interesting is this claw, when it does this, it creates a noise, even though it's a tiny little thing, it creates a noise which is as is, is loud as a blue whale, which is, feels fundamentally strange, doesn't it? A tiny little shrimp, by clicking its big claw, can make a noise, the noise of the biggest thing in the ocean. This interested him, and he started studying the, what's happening here, which is, in effect, a kind of form of bubble clap, and saying, could we apply this to nuclear fusion? And we first heard his story years and years ago, I thought, this is absolutely ridiculous. It's never going to work, and it's going to cost hundreds of millions, right? We've got to back it. <laughs> <laughs> we, like, we, like the, we like the opposite of Dragon's Den, right? You know <laughs> and we've been backing it ever since. Now, I believe he's very close to solving nuclear fusion, very close to solving fusion as a sustainable energy source, and that would be amazing. And it all started with a shrimp, another really, really cool idea. I'd say another idea which is on my mind at the moment, because I've been working with them for the last few months, I believe that this is the future of healthcare, what you're seeing here. And let me tell you why. And I think this little device will, well, in some ways it's not as fundamental as the ability to sequence DNA. I think this will change the whole world of health economics. It's happening in Oxford. and 
Let me tell you why. So if you go to the doctor, it, it's kind of a joke. You, you go there, you wait a long time, you get tested for something, the blood tests go off, you wait weeks, you get ring up, da 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 And it, it just doesn't, doesn't make any sense. And this actually builds on the work of a brilliant chemist who I met in 1997, who again was an inspiration for that deal with the chemistry department, where he looked at sort of diabetics and said, you know, diabetes is a pretty awful condition because you've got no way of testing your blood glucose levels. Imagine if, if diabetics could test themselves. And he ended up working on this throughout his academic career and, and, and in the end set up a company called Medisense, which got bought for a billion dollars nearly 20 years ago. If you know any diabetics, chances are they're using an Oxford technology that came out of the chemistry department. And it's transformed the lives of diabetics. It's, amazing, it's one of Oxford's greatest inventions. It's up there with the synthesis of penicillin. Again, Oxford's not very good at shouting about its big inventions, but it's a massive, impactful invention. What his sort of uh, protege worked on was the next generation. It's like, rather than just being able to test with a tiny drop of blood, a pinprick of blood, what your blood glucose levels are, imagine if you could test for anything, literally anything. Test if you've got a virus or a bacterial infection, because obviously that will change the way you're treated. Check if you're... Um, early onset, if you're, if you're at high risk of cancer, early onset neurodegeneration, start testing for biomarkers. Test for anything, use your imagination, think if you could test with a tiny drop of blood, any individual molecule, you'd have something that is truly special. Trips to the doctors would change. And this is about 20 days away from demonstrating that it can work. Um, it'll probably fail but that's the romance, but we're very, very close to showing that you'll put a tiny drop of blood uh, onto a cartridge, you'll plug it into this thing that could sit on a doctor's office, so you go in and he doesn't send it away, he tests right in front of you, and test for anything you like. You can buy a chip for the thing you want to test for, you can actually even test for multiple things at the same time. And I think this will, be, this will change the way di diseases are diagnosed, but also the way diseases are treated. His ultimate ambition is to deliver this in a handheld device about this size, which everyone can keep in their home. You can test whatever you want, when you want. And this is, this is days away from being a reality. It's taken us about 25 years to get there, so it's not happened quickly, but it's now getting very close to, to being uh, an incredible reality. So why, why, why is Oxford, why is Keeble going to be the center of the tech world. Um, that's kind of where I started out, that's where I'm gonna end. Um, because what are the, uh, as always with me, I try and be silly and serious at the same time. So I'm gonna sort of try and give you the serious messages. So just think back to, to, to the fun slides early on. Just think how long those ideas took to percolate. Those, those amazing ideas, even, even in modern times an idea like DNA it took 50, 60 years before it became useful. But even since 2015, and we're only in 2018, that's three years that OSI has been in existence, we've seen technologies, and those technologies are evolving at, at rates that are truly remarkable. Ideas that are happening in three years would have taken 3,000 years. And the ability of AI to be interacting and iterating and improving and testing is, is incredible, so it's gonna speed up all of these ideas. We're at a time now where I think people are bored of, of, of the big ideas. Uh, the big ideas, by that I mean the internet, the Facebooks, the Googles. People are looking for, you know, there's lots of different ways to get a drone to deliver a pizza more efficiently, or your Amazon order to come next day or the day after next day. Are they really the big inventions that are gonna change the world? Is that really the next 20, 30 years? I think where the world is going is deep science deep science with big ideas. And Oxford, I'm biased, but interestingly, a lot of people are now sharing this view. Oxford, I'd say, is the biggest center in the world today for truly big ideas, truly big deep science ideas. Um, we're fortunate in that Keeble has got an incredible history of scientists coming up with great ideas, but also finances from Keeble funding those ideas. And not just me, by the way, lots of others, Robin Geffen, George Robinson, more and more Keeble people involved in this process. Um, and it is all converging on this rather amazing place over there, which uh, is supposed to be ready. 
no bottles of gin for you. Uh, we're hoping to there, be there by Christmas, Christmas this year. Um, so I believe uh, Keeble's new centre will be amazing. I'm really proud that Roger and Jenny asked OSI to be there. We're going to be there, hopefully at the end of the year. Not only are we going to be there, because we don't really matter, we're just a small team of dedicated people, but we do have 600 million pounds, which helps. And, and our job is to try and help find the best ideas in Oxford and give them money and what's more, give them guidance and try and make those ideas big. And I think the majority of those ideas are all going to start life in the new Keeble Centre, which I think is, is so exciting. So um, the idea that this is the beginning of something special is, is something I've been thinking about for the last couple of years. If, if I look back on my own life, 30 years now I've been accidentally looking at technology. The speed of change, we've not got it in our heads. We've really not got it. It's easy to say, yeah, things are moving faster. You should pause and think of this speed and the speed with which these ideas are going to get to market, get recognized, and the speed with which you can globalize an idea is incredible. We're, it's also quite scary, right? Not all of it's going to be good. There's going to be huge trauma. We're going to have the equivalent of the fall of Constantinople because what do we do with ourselves? What role is there for ourselves, for humanity? So not all of it will be great, but I think the speed with which this innovation is happening is, is truly amazing. I think Oxford is an amazing place. And what I'm most excited about, about after 30 years is that Keeble is, is the center of it all. So probably talk too much, but on that note, thank you. Dave, how much is Bose machine selling for? The what, sorry? Bose machine, how much, uh, his microscope, how much? Good question. So um, the competition is half to a million dollars. So he, he's gone in sort of $200,000. Uh, that's, that's been the average selling price. Um, I can't say what it costs them to make, but it's clearly some fraction of that. Um, but I could see that model evolving where the, the cost of the machine goes down and the applications sort of is where the real money is made. I think he's got an amazing opportunity to shape, shake up an industry. I think, I think it will just change the way microscopy is done in, in that whole industry. Good question, though. I, uh, I've just finished reading a book called Bad Blood. Which Absolutely. focuses very much on what, well, another example of somebody proposing that with a single prick of blood, you can test for everything, and it, it struck me as a, a modern-day example of the emperor's new clothes. They said it can do all this stuff, and it couldn't. And yet it got so much money. And I'm just wondering how you, I guess, give people a chance and build a level of trust um, <laughs> at the same time of doing your due diligence and at, at the same time, that's the elephant balance. So, again, that's a question we've been asking ourselves a lot. And ju just to recap, if you've not read it, you should read it. Uh, my wife just read it, Bad Blood. In fact, I was going to read it, but she took off me. But I do know what is in it. It's an amazing story of Theranos, which was set up by a brilliant, glamorous young lady called Elizabeth Holmes, who managed to actually sell the vision of pretty much what I've just said to you, uh, valued her company at $9 billion, which is an amazing valuation of something that didn't work at all. Um, and, uh, but what I think that, sh and I, I do sort of worry sometimes that people draw the long, wrong lessons from something like that, because to me that showed the potential of an amazing opportunity and why people get excited. And the fact is that most brilliant ideas kind of start out as scams. I mean, this is a, the truth that we don't want to say to ourselves. A great idea, by definition, a great disruptive idea starts out as a scam. Um, and then you work hard to make that into reality. If you look at Turing and, uh, and those guys, they, they, they were almost scammers in some ways. In that they said, well, within 10 years, this will be happening, and it took 50. So to me, the important thing, I think to some extent we're all, we're all chancers, we're all scammers. Oxford's biggest problem is that it doesn't play that game enough. It doesn't boast. It doesn't play the PR. 
I think what it's done for these guys, though, the Theranos story, is really good because it said, like, you cannot come out and just promote this. You've got to show that it works. That's why we've been so secretive about this project for the last two years. We've not told anyone about it. We've only started telling people about it about a week ago because we're so close to it. And we know that we'll be judged on that because if we come along and say, oh, look at this, this is going to do everything, transform healthcare forever, they'll be like, bullshit. You know, we've heard that before. She scammed us. We're just trying to take her to prison and suing her, right? So in some ways, it's been a very good test for us because it's meant like, unless we can demonstrate it, unless I can take your blood and show it, you're not going to believe me. So, but, but I would go back to my other point and say that great ideas take so long to work. We set this up in the King's Arms in 2005. It took 10 years before we could get it to work. 10 years and 200 million pounds. But big ideas are worth trying. But a really good question, it's one that's tortured us. A bit of me, the cheeky side of me said that rather than calling Osler, who was the head of diagnostics uh, and, and a man of Oxford, we should call it Theranox. <laughs> so you're just changing one letter and saying this is based on Oxford science. You mentioned it. So you, you mentioned at the end some sort of potential negatives, but you're clearly a very optimistic person. You always, ha always have been. Um, do you think about the negatives, and do you think, you know, wh whether we should be thinking about those or not doing certain things or not investing in certain things, or do you just take the view that, well, if we don't do it, someone else is going to do it anyway? I, I, again, it does, it, does, it does haunt me at times. That, you know, and I kind of go back to those. I won't go back. It'll take too long. But you know, those amazing Homo erectus people, <coughs> and you sort of think, they went extinct because they were lazy and they didn't innovate. But maybe they lasted a million years because they didn't innovate. I mean, the kind of bizarre idea of hard is like maybe, like maybe our non-stop ability to innovate and our desire and hunger to innovate could be the scariest thing facing humanity. Um, and the, the honest answer is we don't know, right? I, I don't believe the sort of massive headline, oh my god, AI is going to wipe us out, terminate to start in the next five years. I don't, I don't believe that. But nevertheless, I do believe the potential of these technologies we've not thought through and the sort of social and economic upheavals will be traumatic. And, you know, we're coming very close to the point where people will be able to live a very long time. Everyone will want extremely good health care uh, and that health care will be available. And, and the problem is we won't have, I, I struggle to see how all those people and more and more people will be able to contribute economically. So you, you, there, there will be some big questions, but I just take the view it's happening. We're bizarrely fortunate or unfortunate to be at this incredible time uh, in the last two million years and be, and be part of it and watch it. And, and, and so, but I think th th there are big ethical questions that need to be addressed. Uh, but I, I think I'm more worried by the social and economic than the sort of doomsday scenario. Oh no, go. That was great, thanks. You, you focused completely on um, the commercialization side of um, mostly science coming out of Oxford and that's great and excellent no problem with that. Um, it's probably the case that the majority of, say, scientists within the university don't get very close to that side of things. And I assume you appreciate the value of that, what you might call just blue skies research. Um, do you think that there would be a value um, for trying to get more of the, let's say, just funding um, back in from your end of things through to earlier in the university to make it easier for, if you like, the purer researchers mm -hmm. to spend more of their time just doing um, research rather than the, the battle of funding. Interesting, interesting point. I, I remember when I first did that chemistry deal in 2000, uh, and I'd been, because obviously it was 20 million pounds to, to, to sort of, I didn't have the money, I had to blag it from other people and promise them that this is the sort of most commercial chemistry department in the world, they're all hot to do great stuff and it'll all be great. And literally, I, I was sort of going in there about a week later after we'd sent the money over and like, the scientists were literally, literally hiding from me. They'd be like, oh, it's him again. You know, dash me, Anna. Like, let's stay well away. 
you know, it was literally, I, I was literally begging people to sort of come and commercialize. That. They all said, yeah, we're into commercialization because that's what the government were telling them to say. But actually, none of them really cared. There was the odd one, but maybe one, two percent. What's interesting this time around, I've mean, been away from Oxford in 2015, which is 15 years, so not that long. I went back into that chemistry department. I wouldn't say I was mobbed, but I was being hassled, which was amazing, by scientists, not by business people, by scientists saying, I've got this idea. It's a really esoteric idea, but we think it could be amazing. Can you help? Can you help us? So, so I think seeing impact is, is a millennial thing. Millennials love impact. I'm, I'm surrounded by millennials at work. It keeps me young, and I love to see what motivates them. So I think this idea of you do something for money or you do something, it, it, it's all getting blurred anyway. I think scientists want to see their ideas change the world. 20 years ago in Oxford, that wasn't the case. They didn't. Most of them didn't. They just wanted to do what they were doing. So they want to see their ideas impact the world positively. At the same time, if that idea makes them millions of pounds, they can buy the anchor pub and do what they want to do and stay doing the things they love. Interesting, though, about the blue sky side is a lot of the commercial ideas we've backed for, for the last 20 years. I know some of the biggest funders of blue sky science in the university. I mean, so Oxford and Nanopore, this, this, this kind of crazy idea has given millions and millions of pounds back into that chemistry farm to sort of look at new, kind of more blue sky applications. So it's something we worried a lot about in the early days. You know, exploitation. They didn't say commercialization, they said exploitation. So it had this incredibly negative connotation. And now, now in some ways, I wish they were a bit more like they were <laughs> in the olden days, because it's almost like everybody has got an idea that's going to change the world, and that in itself isn't sustainable. So I'm not sure I've directly answered your question, but I think it's something I'm less worried about, and I think there's more and more money prepared to back blue sky ideas. Often it's the most commercial ideas, which bizarrely we're least interested in. I like things, I like things like that. I love it, and, and actually more and more investors are prepared to do that in the world. You know, when Google came and invested in us, I thought Google would be like, yeah, we just want to see all your AI stuff. We want to look at every idea in the computer science department. Actually, they've not been interested in that. Google are much more interested in what are your big ideas that are going to change the world. You know, have you got any big ideas in, say, vaccines? So I'd say the world is a lot more interesting than it's ever been. That sounds a ridiculous statement. But it, it's actually interested in big ideas. And even mainstream venture capitalists who would be like, I need to see your business plan, are much more willing to buy big science. Thanks, hello. It's probably a lead on from the last question. Um, which end of the telescope do you find you, you spend most of your time? Are you looking at ideas with a problem to solve, or are you looking at problems and finding the ideas to solve those? Yeah. Uh, I, I, think, I think we're really science-led. Um, I think most business plans, most sensible business plans, probably 90% of them are looking for, here's a, here's a gap in the market, here's a problem, here's, here's how we're going to attack it, here's why we're going to get moved fast. Da, 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 da. I'd say probably, you know, that, that's less than 10% of what we do. Much more ours is the opposite. The head of cardiology research at Oxford has spent nine years collecting data sets, comes to see us, comes to see Zach. This is what I've done. This is what I think I could do with it. And we're like, mm, this is amazing, but what you're trying to do with it is probably completely wrong. Let's brainstorm. Da, 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 da. I think we, we're really looking for big ideas. Often those ideas we think are pointing in the wrong place. Um, when we first looked at, at this, they were they were thinking of it more as a diagnostic tool. And we're like, no, but that's that's probably not optimizing the technology. Actually, where the real win would be sequencing of DNA. I don't think we've got a. Com I don't think. I don't think I'm particularly good at being a typical venture capitalist. I don't understand consumers. I don't understand markets, and don't really understand business models. So, I'm pretty. I, I, I sort of steer away from that. I think what interests me is what I see as big disruptive technologies. Oxford's not got a reputation for moving fast or efficiently. We've got a reputation for very big ideas that could actually be totally disruptive. So if you go back to sort of 
Beijing's microscope, if he'd come to us and said, look at the microscope market, I can do it sort of 15% smaller and disrupt for these reasons, that wouldn't, that would worry me. Instead, he says I'm doing it for 10% of the size. And that's the kind of, we need to see that kind of quantum difference in technology, because we know it's going to take longer. And we know the incumbents are going to fight much harder. So, so we all, so I would say 90% of what we do is, is, is big science-led. 